I'm Chris Burns, and welcome to The Network, hard talk with the matrix of newsmakers. The headlines. Every year, a quarter of a million children go missing in Europe. A hotline, 116,000, has been highly effective in reuniting them with their families or finding help for them. It includes children who fled from war zones or were victims of abuse or exploitation. An awareness campaign also tackles the issue of parental abductions of children. But EU funding for the hotline is to run out at the end of the year, leaving it to member states, putting it in jeopardy. Can national support and donations sustain the hotline? 20 years after the child kidnapping murders by Belgian psychopath Marc Dutroux, Europe is more vigilant. But are authorities and civic groups working closely enough? Now wired into this edition of the network here at the European Parliament in Brussels, Delphine Morales, Secretary General of Missing Children Europe, which includes 30 member organizations in 24 countries. Catherine Bearder, a member of the European Parliament and of the Alliance for Liberals and Democrats, or ALDE, and Alain Remu, Commanding Officer of the Missing Persons Unit of the Belgian Federal Police. Welcome to all of you. Question to all of you, starting with Delphine. As we mentioned, more than a quarter of a million children missing, reported missing every year. That's one every two minutes. Half of them runaways. Does this problem seem to be getting worse to you? I wouldn't say that it is. I think we've gotten better at alerting people about the issue, and we've gotten better about increasing reporting to the hotlines, to law enforcement, etc. But it doesn't mean that we stop there. And I think the countries that I worry about the most are those countries where a low amount of children are being reported missing. These kids are missing, they're just not being reported. Catherine, a 200% increase in calls to that 116,000 hotline from 2012 to 2014. That's quite a jump. That does, seem, does it seem like the, the system is being overwhelmed by this? Well, it's certainly being used, and it's used, being used by the families and, and those people who are concerned with the children that are missing. And it gives vital support, emotional support, at a time of huge crisis for any family that have, have, have lost a child. They need somebody that can talk to them. Okay, and Ella, from you working on the ground as a, as a police officer, what do you see? Is, is the problem getting worse? Some of these cases, unfortunately, they have a bad end. And that gives the feeling that things aren't going that well. Fortunately, there aren't that many real alarming cases. There are a lot of children who, who go missing. And all of them, they have a certain degree of, of worries. But hmm. you have to make differences. But too many children are disappearing. Okay, uh, let's, let's turn to that uh, ending of funding. That uh, uh, could be an issue next year. Uh, while this workload uh, seems to be pretty steady, uh, the European Commission is going to end the funding at the end of the year. What happens then? How will you fill that gap? Catherine, how do you see from a policy well, perspective? There will be nobody at the end of the telephone when, when people need that help. And, you know, in terms of EU budgets, it's, it's small. Four and a half million for two years might sound like a lot of money. But actually, you know, that's one trip from the Parliament to go from Brussels to Strasbourg for a week. I mean, that puts it into context. Oh, yeah, that's this another is, issue, though. This is, I, well, yes, I mean, I know a lot of MEPs would gladly give up going to Strasbourg if it would help missing children. You know, these children, if it was your child, if it was my child, you would move heaven and earth to make sure that that child was found. Delphine, what, what, what happens when that funding ends? Does the whole thing shut down? Uh, Forty percent, I think, of your, uh, the people who work on those staffs are being paid. Are paid. Exactly. So the, the hotline is manned to a great extent by volunteers who are being trained quite extensively. So that uh, would continue? That would presumably continue, but you also need to pay your telephone bills, you need to pay your rent, you need to pay the paperwork. So we know from a research that we did last year that 56% of the hotlines feel that the EU funding is essential in continuing their services. Now, this being said, I think the national authorities have a responsibility too. There is a universal service directive that has an Article 27A that puts an obligation on the member states to make sure that people have access to that hotline. Okay. What happens at that level? Well, yeah. We need a combination. But on, on the national level, they're being told to do something they don't have the money for. Exactly. So how, do, how does that work on a national level, Anna? We see that a lot of information comes through the hotlines, not only through police hotlines, but definitely NGOs. I, you have the feeling that people are, uh, are quicker to respond to an appeal through an NGO hotline mm. than through law enforcement. So it would be pity 
to okay, lose so that opportunity. So, so Kathleen, uh, Catherine, you, you, think, you think we can find the money somehow for that possibly? I sincerely hope, hope we will. I mean, uh, it, we need to go back and look and find that money because uh, it is such a vital service. Uh, and and uh, as we've heard, sometimes people don't like to ring the police if they've seen something suspicious or, or whatever because they don't want to get it, but they'll go to, in, in the UK, NSPCC or Bernardo's will pick up that phone or missing children is, is the other hotline. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, now let's, let, let's shift to this anniversary, 20 years after the Marc Dutroux child kidnap murders. How much safer can we, can children, can parents feel uh, now that we've set up this hotline, we've set up more coordination between police and uh, between law enforcement and civic groups, but is, is, is that enough? Can we feel safe now, Delphine? Well, first of all, I think fear is not the right motivation if you want to protect our children. I think we need to make sure that we empower children to be self-confident. And we know from the case load of the hotlines, but it also reflected within the work of the police, that only 1% at large of the cases that we deal with are these kind of criminal abductions by third persons. So should we feel f safer? I think we have learned a lesson and know that we need to protect children by talking to them, by teaching them how to protect themselves. And the hotlines are there to support in 29 European countries. So that's a lot. I believe a, a third of these child missing children uh, cases are cross-border. Mm -hmm. So that's a question of coordination. How is that working? How is that working, Alan? Well, yeah, that's very important because there are no borders anymore. And that's why we have, uh, in law enforcement, networks like Interpol, Europol. Are you and, really talking to each other, though? Are you talking yes, to each other? Yes, we talk to each other. And there's something I want to stress. Since the Detroit case happened in Belgium, we had to learn a lot of lessons. In fact, you, I think you, you helped to set up that. Yep, that's right. And we have a department. central missing persons unit in the federal police. It would be great if every EU member state had a specialized central missing persons unit. Can we see movement in the European Parliament on that somehow? Get, on a European level, get some kind of a system. I will be doing what I can mm -hmm. because, you know, these children deserve protection and caring for by the, the people who have been elected to look after them. Yes, it, it's, it's always easier if you can talk to fellow officers who know the issue, mm. who know what it is looking for missing children, missing persons. Don't and you don't have to, to go through the whole system. Right. Just talk to each other and know what you talk about. That's very important. Right, and, and, and cross-border also includes a cross-border from other parts of the world as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, the, the refugees from Syria, refugees from Absolutely. Ukraine and so forth. How are you dealing with that, Delphine? So that's a big issue, obviously. Missing unaccompanied migrant children. We know that in average and very roughly, about 50% of the kids that arrive in the EU unaccompanied go missing within the first 48 hours. That is a challenge. These kids move from country to country and we need to make sure that we work together in allowing a coordinated approach, integrated cooperation between law enforcement, hotlines, asylum authorities, guardians and reception centres. And we're not there yet, so we are focusing quite a bit on that. And the hotlines, if I may say, have the possibility to provide assistance across borders. We had a case just a couple of months ago of a two-week-old baby that was taken from Italy to, Sp to France and then to Spain. And the hotlines were able to communicate with each other within minutes and provide assistance to the mother who stayed in Italy. Finally, a missing children, a missing child case, the first 24 hours are said to be the most critical. Catherine, I think you've had some criticism for some local authorities in Britain. Are authorities moving fast enough right now? No, and, and, and it is getting these different agencies lined up. We have traffic children that arrive at airports and they're found as unaccompanied minors and put into social uh, services care. And, of course, the traffickers know the language these children speak. They will phone them up and, and arrange to meet them and, and uh, they go missing. But nobody alerts the police because, uh, you know, the, the, the parts are not lined up. We need much better coordination, be not only cross-border between the police, but also between the agencies within countries. OK. Delphine, are authorities no, I... moving fast enough? Uh, well, I think we've, we've improved, but I think indeed, as Catherine says, we need to have a coordinated approach, an embedded approach, where we protect children from going missing uh, and, and we respond immediately when they do. And currently, it is not moving fast enough, and I think we have a, a lot of work ahead of us. Anna, you're going to defend yourself there? Yeah. <laughs> you know, like you said, the first hours are essential. Every case is different, but time is very important. Time and communication, that's what it's all about. Thanks, Alain. I'd like to thank all of our guests, Delphine Morales, Catherine Bearder, and Alain Remu. I'm Chris Burns, and until next time, thanks for connecting with The Network.